Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called The Liberation of Reichberg, and it plays two to four players. It takes about mm, 45 minutes to play, and is for ages 10 and up. And in the game Liberation of Reichberg, you are basically trying to liberate Castle Reichberg. Reichberg has been taken over by a den of monsters and is now inhabiting the castle, and you and up to three other players are going to attempt to head into the castle and storm the gates and remove the monsters. After removing the monsters, objective cards will pop up and you'll have to deal with them. Certain things like Brander's Honor Guard might need saving, or perhaps you'll have to find the Hadrian Fire. And you're going to go throughout that until you find a certain number of objectives and clear them. Now, just knowing what the objectives are isn't going to be enough to save you. And in order to do all this, you're going to be given cards. These cards you're going to play, and as you play, you'll take turns playing any of the cards that you have in your hand, but you don't get them back until after all the cards you have have been played. Then you'll pick up cards, but there's a cost to picking up cards. More monsters are going to enter the fray, and as more monsters enter the fray, more things will be out there for you to deal with, and it might be difficult for you to complete said tasks. And every player is going to make more monsters come into play as their cards get put back into their hand from being played. Each character class has unique and special little things that they can do, whether it be utilizing spells, or utilizing arrows, or perhaps even just having a huge axe that just has a one-time use that just slams into the enemy minions. You'll find bosses, you'll find a ton of different little imps, you'll find characters that are friends that will help you throughout the through, all, through along the way, and you're also going to find unique and interesting quests that you'll have to complete in order to win the game, the liberation of Reichberg. Anyway, let's go take a look down below. In this game of uh, the Andor series, if you played the original game, uh, we'll take you down below. I'll show you what comes in the game, how a basic idea is played really quick, just to give you an idea, because it's very simple to learn and play, and then we'll come up and we'll discuss the game with my review. Welcome to Reitberg Castle, where you'll see all the components for the game, other than, of course, the box and the rule book here, which explains the game in great detail. This is the setup for three players, and I've already put the three characters on the board, so we wouldn't be playing with Cram here, Orphan, or this guy named Thorn. So you can actually set them aside from the game if you're not playing with them. There are narrator cards, there are these objective cards, you're going to be getting encounter cards, and then you're also going to be using tokens based on the characters, as well as willpower for all the characters. Now, to set up the game, it's pretty simple. Take an objective and place it in each of the slots here. There should be six of them. Them. Then, based on the number of players, they'll be set here, these characters, on number six, and you'll multiply that by two, so in a three-player game you'll get six narrator cards, you'll flip them over, and then you will place down the monsters that are going to come out, so these little encounter cards, in up to two areas, depending on if you're playing easy mode or hard. If you're playing or easy mode, is going to be simply one uh, whenever there's a red one, and hard mode is you'll play both the red and you'll play the non-red. And so it tells you basically how you can increase the difficulty. I do always increase the difficulty, but you can choose to do so or not. Place 10 narrator cards afterwards here on the space. This is going to be your entire game length. All the rest of the narrator cards you won't use, as well as the rest of the uh, required these, these little uh, requirements here you need to do or complete. Usually you have to complete four of them, and so you only need to have the six out here. Then you're going to make sure you have all the tokens for each of the characters you're playing with. In this case, Cram has the axe, and we won't be needing this, so we'll put him over here. But Era is going to be using the Books of Spells. You're going to have Keela, which is going to be using this Water Spirit. And then you have Chada, which is going to be using these arrows. And everybody will use Willpower. So, now that I've basically shown you the entire setup of the game, the last thing you need to know is the Friends deck will go here. Make sure you shuffle every single deck up before dealing anything out. And then, based on the number of players times two, you'll set these cards out. And it'll tell you how it works. So in this one here, it says, place a card face up on slot two. So this is a card face up on slot two. Place a card face down on slot one. And you'll do that, rinse and repeat, based on the number of players. Some of them are a little more tricky, like it'll say wherever the, mo the active player is currently at. Um, there might be one or two other different unique aspects to how you're placing cards down, but in general, it's just placing cards face down or face up onto the board. And then you're ready to begin. And a player will start the game just by simply taking the cards, playing them one at a time, 
and doing whatever action they want. There's three choices for each of the cards. They could be to move, they could be to pick up arrows and shoot, uh, they could be to flip over the specific character cards or turn over specific um, monster cards, I should say. They could be to take cards back, use their special abilities, as well as flipping over or destroying face down event type things, all different types of things you can go ahead and do. You're also going to be fighting the monsters. They'll have a health on the top right hand side. When you defeat them, if you defeat them, you can gain certain things from them depending on what is required for whatever your specific objectives are. And some of them are actually gonna be worth gold as well. You, some unique monsters are gonna be based on the number of face up monsters on the board, but this is just one example of monsters that can be different in the game. As well as when you go onto certain spaces, you have certain free actions. Free actions are when you're on a space, you can go ahead and flip over certain things like events and monsters and whatnot, as well as, of course, you're able to move based on cards as well, It'll tell you on the card. You can move here and flip over a card here. So it has unique twists to all the different characters and how they function throughout the game. Eventually, when you get through a stack of encounters, you'll be able to flip over one of these objectives here and read it, and it'll tell you, uh, you are allowed to have no more than four encounter cards at each of the six locations. And if you have that completed, with only having a certain number of encounter cards at each of the locations, you can take this card and that is one of your trophies. And cards are all trophies. You will use them most likely throughout the entire game, whether it's to buy unique items that can come from the encounter deck, or whether it's to simply use them for the requirements to fulfill on these objective cards here. You might run into a wine skin or maybe the Heart Hadrian Hourglass. And so you're gonna be finding different things throughout this game. You can technically fight as a party as long as you're all in the same position. But when you're not in the same position, there are only certain things you can do. For instance, you can like have the Kila send her water spirit out, or Era is going to be able to use a specific spell from her spell book that can do three damage to any location as opposed to just her own. So it's kind of beneficial to sometimes move around to specific locations with enemies that have large health. For instance, this is 12 damage. So having multiple people there in order to work together to defeat the monster is important. Another thing to note is as you're playing cards, so he would play one card, he would choose to do his thing, maybe move and pick up one of these arrows. She would go ahead and flip over one of her cards. She maybe chooses to move four spaces and she can actually move herself maybe uh, two spaces, one, two, and then she can move every other player a space. That's how movement kind of works. And then he would flip over one of his cards. Maybe he chooses to take a spell and use its ability. And then after that, everybody does that up until the point they have no cards or they choose to want to go ahead and take all the cards back into their hand. Basically, any cards that are face up, they can go ahead and take back in their hand face down. Now, when they do that, though, they'll trigger another event, which functions just like this, or a narrator card, and it'll make more monsters come into play. Oh, no, a new monster came into play face up in area four. And oh, no, a new monster came face down into area five. And basically, that's how the game functions. When this deck runs out, if it runs out, you're going to lose. And the only way you're going to win is if you complete up to four objectives throughout the game. Yeah, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different objectives and different character cards and stuff like that that has unique abilities. But we'll kind of talk about that in my review. This is just a basic overview as to how the game is played. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward, I think. Let's come up and discuss it. The Liberation of Wrightburg is a cooperative game in which players are attempting to save the castle Wrightburg. I have explained that already. But now that you've seen the game, I think you have a good idea of how it kind of feels when you're going around from different locations in the castle, attempting to defeat the monsters, whether they be face up or face down, and then complete the objectives in order to win the game. Now, of course, there are a bunch of objectives, and you only have enough time to complete a certain amount, and I believe that total is four, and if you can do that, you're going to win the game. Yeah, my dog keeps barking. I don't know why. Or not barking, sneezing. Uh, regardless, though, what my favorite aspect about this game is are the little tokens that each of the unique characters are going to get. And each character feels very different. Each character gets three cards, except for one character that gets four cards, which is nice because he gets to last a little longer. He's got a little more endurance. The spellcaster has books that all start face up. And what's really cool about them is that you're going to be utilizing those spells and you can see what they are and you can use them in conjunction together or just simply one at a time. And when you take your cards back, you'll flip over your spells and get to use them again. And not every spell is damage, which is kind of nice as well. You're going to have the big axe wielder who actually gets an axe for plus four. 
and when he uses it, it flips over, and now he gets a static plus one. But if he spends two gold, he can flip it back over, and he'll get plus four again to use in attacks. A water spirit that gets a command to help increase her damage as she's in the location, or other players' damage in other locations that move around and help the unit. It's kind of like a familiar for the character. Or another really cool character, which is Chada. A ton of arrows are present in this game. That's because you're not, you're not going to use them more than once. But they're random. You could get something like 6 attack damage, 9 attack damage, or something small, like 4. And you're picking these arrows up and hurtling them at your opponents after you've gathered them, hopefully doing a ton of damage with her, but it's kind of a slow buildup. As well as just simply, what's this guy? Which one is it? This, oh, uh, oh yeah, this one here. Uh, Carl. Not Carl. Thorn. Thorn, that's the one I like. He does 8 and 6 and 4 damage on all of his cards, so he is just a strong damage dealer, and he's got a lot of ways to gather willpower, and willpower gives you even more damage. So he, while it might be a basic character, is something that can be very, very needed if there are those big monsters out there. But yeah, all the characters are so unique. That's awesome. That has such a nice variance in this game, and it's so different when you're playing them. You feel like you're playing a different character that does different things. Some of them are definitely slower. Some of them are definitely faster or stronger with unique abilities. Do you want to go ahead and draw and chance your damage, or do you want to know what your damage is? And chancing is like the arrow. You shoot it, yeah, you have a certain idea of accuracy after you've already gathered the arrows, but what ones you gathered, who knows? Maybe you got the black arrow, the defeat of the dragon smog. Or maybe you got uh, the puppy arrow of stinkiness, who only does one damage. You, you don't really know, right? But the, the wizard, he knows, or she knows, what damage is going to be dealt with what spells. But they only have a limited amount of mana, so you can only use a certain amount until you have to gather your cards back, thus putting new narrator cards out and having more creatures come out. Other things that I don't talk about too much, didn't talk about too much, was like these characters here, the bad guys, right? The, this troll. It's worth, it has got 12 hit points. He's hard to defeat, and you have to defeat him with heroes, which has a team style battle. But when you do the team battles, the, those characters will have to use their cards as well. Uh, certain victories will grant you friend cards. After a victorious battle, you receive a friend card, and the active player will get one of these cards, which I didn't talk about too much. There's not too many of them. I think there's like eight of them. But they are unique character cards that go into your hand. And you can play them, just like you would play one of your normal three cards. And you'll take them back into your hand after you've played them as well. Which items do a similar thing, but once items are played, they get discarded and they go into a pool. So you can only use them one time. But these guys come back into play over and over again. This guy says you can take the top two encounter cards from any location, turn them both over, and then return one of them to the location. So it could actually benefit you by destroying certain location cards. Um, or the Water Magician from Danwar. You may move any one hero to a location of your choice. So you can play this, move a character to any location you want, and not lose any of those extra cards. That one card difference might make it so that your last narrator card doesn't get played, thus the tr trigger the end of the game. You want to make sure you win the game before narrator cards have all been played and somebody needs to draw back up. That's just not good. <laughs> Uh, all the symbols are relatively easy to understand, but they're also on these nice player reference cards, which is cool. Explains how each of the unique abilities for each of the characters goes, the narrator cards, and then you've got the symbols on all the basic player cards. Once you've played the game one time with that character, or even the first round of one time after that character, you know how all the abilities function. You won't need to look at the narrator cards again. Artwork is solid in the game. The characters are nice. They're little standees. I, I don't think it matters whether it's miniature or standees they work just fine either way i always prefer miniatures but in this case you're, you're not using them too much you just move them to the location and the arc is really nice on them the nice thick cardboard the board is nice thick cardboard and all the pieces are also nice as well and it gives you enough different replayability i already saw, showed you there's a, d a bunch of extra narrator cards that you don't use so there's six of them extra you don't use in a three-player game but i think you use all of them in a four-player game and then we've got, or at least close to all of them, the extra different uh, objectives that you're going to be completing throughout the game, which is the most way to change the game because these things require certain require have certain requirements. You must remove all encounter cards from his, this task card. But some of the encounters have unique blue text on them, which means you have to do this first as you flip over the encounter card before you can complete it. First, select two creatures from your trophy gallery, cards you've already defeated, and then shuffle them and place them face down on this task card. Oh, what if you put bosses on there you defeated two bosses and flipped this over 
that's that's super scary regardless though this is a really excellent game it's a really great cooperative game this is going to go next to my forbidden island it's going to go next to my uh oh uh, what do you call it the fires of uh, Eld elder turn something like that the fires of uh, i'll post it up here regardless though but i really enjoy these type of cooperative games that are quick and simple and have a nice little stylization that doesn't feel the same as every other cooperative game but you kind of get an idea of how to play it after you have uh, gone through one or two rounds of the game the characters all being very different the artwork all being very stylistic and of course it being in the same world of the andor uh, world which is really cool makes me want to get the previous game or games in the series and i'm probably gonna look at them after this after this review is done regardless though if you want to pick up the game by cosmos go ahead check a look down below link in the description you can pick this game up cooperative fun family game if i were to recommend any negatives i mean it's just as i guess it's a little more of a lighter style game but it has a challenging difficulty level if you want it but it's never going to get into that superior like deep strategy thick deep thinky type of games but realistically if you like a cooperative game and you like something that's like medium light style you're going to really enjoy this game i highly recommend it